All right, welcome back. So we are at chapter eight. We looked at we're at the second point. As his body, we represent Jesus and we reveal Jesus. That means what we uh, we are the salt. People see us. We are like a gospel that is walking about, right? We walk in light as he is in the light. We see him. We uh, we walk in forgiveness. We walk in love. We we display everything that Jesus displayed in his earthly ministry. Our ability to represent Jesus comes from the fact that he fills us with himself. That means what? Christ fills us with, his, with himself. In our own ability, we cannot do it. Colossians 2, 9 and 10. For in him dwells all the fullness of Godhead boldly. And you are complete in him who's the head of all principality and power. Positionally, positional truth means that this is a reality in spiritual truth. So, for example, you and I right now, Ephesians 1 also talks about seated with him in heavenly places. So you and I are right now here, but in the spiritual, we're seated with him in heavenly places. So as we go about doing what we are doing, we must reveal who Jesus is to the people around us. Now, can we do it on our own strength? Impossible. Can we do it on our own flesh? Impossible. So that's what Jesus is saying. Or he fills us. Christ fills us with his presence so that we can walk. You know, I've heard of this very, it's an allegory. It's a wonderful story. and I've. I heard about this story. You know, these believers, you know, are like salt in a salt. How many of you have seen a salt shaker? You've seen that salt, right? In a restaurant, you take the salt and you, you just put some of it in your dish. So these believers are like salt. They're inside the salt. And they're all talking to each other. And they're saying, hey, you know, uh, it's good to be together in fellowship. All of us are together in this place, uh, spending time together. And then one of the salt members in that group says, listen, do you see that hot you know, bowl of soup or you see that hot curry that is being made? Yes. One day, that man will take the salt and put some of us and we will never see our brothers and sisters again. They're gone into that. And then they're all fearful. But one of the other salt brothers says, listen, all that is true. But the moment we enter that soup, that soup will not taste the same. It will have flavor. Uh, this is a moment I heard this. It really struck me. Being salt, we may have to go through challenges and difficulties. But even as we go through them, Remember that we are impact, impacting the world. We are making a change. The moment the salt goes into the soup, the taste of the soup changes. We have impacted the soup. The soup has not impacted the salt. You get what I'm saying, right? It's a. Remember, we are talking about this in uh, in Ministry of the Evangelist, pastor and teacher. Hyperboles, right? Uh, or exaggerations. That's what we are. We are the salt, right? So as a body, thirdly, uh, as his body, we are his hands. We are his feet. We do his will. We are his hands. We are his feet. So we listen to him. We move. We execute. And he continues to speak. So you're planting a local church. You pray. He speaks, you listen, you execute. He speaks, you listen, you execute. You are the hands, you are the feet. You have to do it, right? And when we do it, he continues to bring direction. And we have plenty of verses in the scriptures which teach us on God's direction, right? His word is a light unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. His word brings clarity, brings direction to our soul. 
right? So we listen, but we execute. God is speaking, we execute. Matthew 10, 40, he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Jesus sees himself extended through us. Oh, this is so beautiful. Jesus sees himself extended through us. That means when you start a local church or you're serving in a local church, Jesus is seeing himself extended through us. No, he's representing me. Listen to him. Did Jesus do that in the, I mean, did, the, did God work that way in the Old Testament? Yes. All through the Old Testament, God is sending prophets. He's saying, you listen to him. You listen to the prophet. You obey him. Obey what he's saying. Good for you. I will make things right. But the moment you disobey, the moment you keep turning away from what I'm telling you, you're, you're, you're killing the prophets. You're killing the word that they are speaking. You're disobedient. Then there's nothing I can do. So it was like the prophets were representing God's plan and purposes in the nation of Israel. Right? So if you read you know, from the time of Elijah, God told, God told Elijah, tell Ahab not to marry Jezebel. Very clearly. But he went and got married. God told Elisha, tell the Israelites, you know, this is what you must do. God told the prophets on and on again. God told David, right? He proved prophets, do this, do this, do this. You either accept it and believe and come back into God's will, or you deny it and go out of God's will. But here, as his feet, as his hands, as his body, we do what he tells us to do. Right? We are an extension of who he is. Okay, next one. As his body, we are in relationship with one another. We are connected to each other. We serve one another. Now, as a local body, uh, we are different in terms of role and function in the body. Right? We're all not the same. So if you look at it, um, it's like we are... When the Lord looks at us as a local church, we may be, you know, for example, 500 people. Let's take APC as an example, right? Each one of us is a member of this church, but none of us are not needed or not required in the church. We all are required. We are not independent, but we are interdependent. We need each other in the local church. Whether you are 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, or even beyond that. We need each other in the church. We need to learn and appreciate and celebrate each other's gifts and functions. Now here comes the difficult part. Sometimes in a local church, if we are not careful, when jealousy and strife may come in, then we no longer appreciate and celebrate each other's functions, but it becomes a uh, competition. This is a dangerous place to be in. For example, if I know that another person is a good teacher or a preacher, as a leader, I must give them opportunities. If I don't, then there's I don't appreciate his function or his gifting that God has placed in him. Right. Now I'm not saying immediately give them high or the biggest opportunity that's available. No, but we start small. Give them small. Right. Again, in leadership, give them small things, see how faithful they are, let them develop, grow, check, and maintain hard attitudes and take them from one place to another. Now, for example, if I look at others and say, how come he or she got the opportunity, but I didn't get when I am better than him or her? The moment I think that, I've allowed the enemy to bring competition and jealousy and strife into my heart. So I need to come to a place 
to understand that as a local church, I must complement each other. I must complement and appreciate the gifts that you have. Right? Now, for example, I may I may plan to, you know, God may say, start a Hindi service. So now to start a Hindi service, we have to plan. So what do I need for Hindi service? Hindi people. Hindi volunteers, obviously. I need somebody who can translate. I need a good worship team who can sing Hindi songs. I need people who can minister in Hindi. Just because I preach in English doesn't mean I can handle the whole Hindi service. Right? Example. So I need somebody who can speak in Hindi, translate many things involved, worship, everything, translation of the sermon notes, many things involved. So I need to complement each other. I need to look at people's gifts and talents and as a local church, appreciate it. That way, what are we doing? We are building the local church. Hey, you are good at, you know, uh, maybe uh, you're good at responsibilities. So you become a team leader for this team. I'm appreciating it. It's not that I'm saying, okay, you you know you you do something very small for now, or you uh, it's okay. You, I'll give you an opportunity next year. No, just, again, it depends on the role, but you're recognizing people's gifts and functions. Next, we are not to be envious of somebody else's gift, role, and function. Just because a person is leading worship. Now, I, should, I must not be envious of him or jealous. Hey, I want to lead worship. It's a good desire. right? So we have to plan and prepare and prepare ourselves to become a worship leader. And then you leave the results up to God. If your heart is right, remember this. God will take you and use you. Very simple. There may be 1,000 people better than you. But if you have the right heart, if you are in right position, you've aligned yourself to God, God will handpick you and use you. I am telling you this. There may be people much better than you. They may be able to speak better than you. They have a double degree. They have masters. They have um, better speaking abilities, understanding abilities, and very you know uh, eloquent in the way they are. All of that may be there. But God can zero in on you and choose you for something that he has called you for. But your heart should be in the right position. Remember that. Don't think too much of yourself. Don't think too less of yourself. God, if I have to become a worship leader, I'll prepare myself. Learn the instrument. Learn how to sing. Do everything. If an opportunity comes, I'll take it gladly. If an opportunity doesn't come, I will wait for that opportunity, and I know you'll give it to me. That's the right place to be in. Right? That's a beautiful place to be in. So there's no pressure, there's no disappointment. Right? We can never claim independence in a local church. Recognize that others have been placed around you, around your life, and you have been placed into others' lives. So people can speak into your life. You speak into people's lives. We can never be independent. Right? One of the things I always do is I talk to, uh, you know, especially couples who have children who are, you know, 14, 15 years old. I, I, I like to talk to them because I know my kids are getting there. So I talk to them, I ask them, what do you do? Like, especially if they have boys, right? I talk to them. I ask them, what do you do? Now, they are surprised. Hey, why is pastor asking me this? Is I, did I do, is it something that I have done? I said, I want to know because my boys are going to become 13, 14 in a couple of years. So I just want to know, what do you do? How do you correct them? How do you, you know, I can't take the stick when they're 14, 15. Come on, I need to change, right? I need to think how I'm dealing with them now. So how do you do it? Now, parenting may not be one of my strengths, but I can learn it from somebody else, right? Or um, you know, uh, it could be something else, right? Uh, how to spend time with family. How, okay, so how do you do it? 
as a leader, businessman who's busy Monday to Friday, traveling at times, how do you set apart time with your family? So I learn. Now they may have questions about the word, or you know, they will say, How did you study? Where did you, you know, how do you where do you get your resources from? I say, Okay, I go to commentaries, I read this book, I read that book. Um, you know, these are what is available online. Right, so go back there, read. You'll get some information. These are some of the authors I read. So he's speaking into my life about a different topic. I'm speaking into his life in a different topic. So in a church, we are not independent, but we are interdependent. We help each other. We learn from each other. God does not want any strife or division in His body, but we demonstrate mutual love and care. How do we know God does not want uh, strife? Remember Paul writes to the Corinthians? He's very stern with them. He says, listen, I see that you people are flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. You all have all this anointing. But there's one big problem. Some of you are saying, I follow Paul. One is saying, I follow Cephas. One is saying, I follow Apollos. What is happening? Did any of them die on the cross for you? Did Peter die on the cross for you? Did I die on the cross for you? Who is Cephas? Who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are nothing. It is Christ's body. And he was really stern with the church, saying, how can you be flowing in the gifts of the Spirit, yet live in division? So there's think of this. There's one group standing there, okay, the followers of Apollos. There's one group standing there, the followers of Peter. Another group saying, hey, we should all follow Jesus. But they're all coming together in one church. All of them are praying, flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. But in the mind, there's division. Paul said, no. You have to walk in oneness. You have to walk in love. And you have to be able to ensure that you protect this local church. Right? So practical ways on how ways a local church can implement this. How can you and I be a body in relationship with one another? A few things. Remember, our identity, our life and identity flows from Him. So whatever gifts we have, whatever talents and skills that we have, it flows from God. So it's not our own. If it's God, Jesus said, freely you've received, freely you give. So if you know guitar, teach others. If you know keyboard, teach others. No, I know, you know, especially I used to teach music, and when people don't get it, we get really upset. Yes, many times I, I would teach people, so you have to play this chord like this. They will do the opposite. I'll say, why is it so difficult for you? Put your finger here. <laughs> That's all you have to do. But they, don't, they may not get it right, and then we may end up getting upset. But remember, the gifts that God has given you is to... It flows from Him. We need to be patient enough to learn to handle ourselves and teach other people. So we represent, as His body, we represent Him, focus on revealing Jesus. We are His hands and feet, and we are in relationship with each other. Challenges to be prepared for. We have to do all of this, but there's going to be challenges. One, culture and social backgrounds. You may be from a person from North India and a person from South India meet together in the middle of this Madhya Pradesh, and they are both a part in part of one church. Now, both are leaders in two different teams. One is sound and setup. One is media team. Now, media team guy is saying, "No, this is how we'll do it." Sound and setup guy is saying, "No, this is how we do it." In when I was in uh, Delhi, we did it like this. This South Indian guy is saying, when I was in Bangalore, we did it like this. Now what's happening? Two different backgrounds. Now, this is just an example, right? It could be many other things. But these are challenges that we may see. But we've got to put all of these aside. The point is not our social backgrounds, our culture, all of that. The point is, we have to stay in unity to build this church. Two, misapplication of being the body. That means they don't understand what a body means. 
you know, we can come to church and keep doing church over and over and over again for months and years and years and years and still have strife between people, still do things independently, not interdependently, but independently. Now, this is this becomes a problem. Sometimes we take our problems and we put it under the carpet. It's not dealt with from the root. It's there, but suddenly one day the wind will blow, the carpet is going to come out and all the anger, jealousy, pride, everything is going to come out. Why? It's not been dealt with. So misapplication of being the body, thinking that I can do everything on my own. It is my church. This is what this is how I will do it. No. The vision is yours. Everything that's true. But as a local church, God sees it. God, when God sees it, he expects us to work together in teams, to be independent, to interdepend on each other. Right? So how do we balance this as leaders? Very important. Keep speaking the vision. Sp keep speaking what the word of God says. Keep reiterating it to your church. This is what we are. If you, you know, one of the things that we have is if anyone have any questions, any question in our church, it could be a question regarding the public ministry. It could be questions regarding the money that is being used. It could be questions regarding our pastoral team, regarding the volunteers, regarding the sound and setup team, regarding a person, any question. They can write to us, they can come meet us, and they are open to speak to us. We are there. If they want to, you know, there are people who want to revoke their membership, meaning they don't want to be part of APC anymore. They, they write and say, please revoke my membership. I want to be part of another church. Absolutely fine. They come, we talk to them, we ask them what happened. It's not like, okay, go. No. We ask them what happened. Is there a reason? So they give the reason, and we move on. Now, the reason may be a valid reason, may not be a valid reason. If it's a valid reason, we work on it. If it's not a valid reason, we move on. Right? So we reiterate to the church right? uh, anything, anything they have, right? Even each of you, you have anything regarding the Bible college or some things that you want to say. Now, if it's valid, don't write an email saying, I want two hours lunch break. That won't work. It should be valid, right? Valid points. We will take it and work on it, right? So the first one is the local church is the body of Christ. We are a body. We work together. Should we go next? Chapter 9. The local church is the family of God. Now, first one we saw is the body, right? Second one is family. Now, Galatians 6.10. Let's read that. And also, let's read uh, Ephesians 2.19. Galatians 6.10, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Ephesians 2.19, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Yeah. So in both the verses, Paul is bringing in that point, underline that word household, household, right? Talking about a spiritual house. And first Peter two, five, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. Now we are a family of God. Now in a family as believers, we are sons and daughters, fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters. How will you be in your house? It's in your own house. You see, right now, most of you are in the hostel, right? So there are rules, and you follow it, and all of these things. Now, in your own house, there's a lot of home is home. Yes or no? No matter what. It can be a hut, or it can be a palace. Doesn't matter. So we call it a home. You can have a you can have a big building or a big house, but don't have a home, meaning that relationships. 
Now, Jesus is saying, you are a spiritual house. Now, in this home, Jesus is the head of the family. Right? The Lord Jesus is a son over his own house. Right? And so, you know, very important to understand this now. As a home, as a house, if the house is dirty, what would you do? When my kids come home from school, they take the uniform and throw it. So I had to sit them down. I said, sit down here. Whose house is this? They said, it's my house. So who should keep the house clean? I should keep the house clean. So then I showed them, see, this is a hanger. After you finish, you come, you take off your shirt, you put it on this hanger, take off your tie, your uniform, you put it on this hanger, and you hang it here. So that tomorrow, when you wake up in the morning, firstly, you will not be running around, where is my uniform? Two, it, it's neat, the house is clean. Then, your shoes, take off your shoes, your socks, put your socks for wash, you keep your shoes in the right place. Where will you keep it? So I showed them. So. Now, if I don't show them and I keep saying, okay, this is a house, do what you want, your house, you know, do what you want, what will happen? Gone. Clothes will be all over the place. One shoe will be in the terrace, one shoe will be here. Everything will be a mess. So if I don't teach them, I can't blame them. I have to blame myself. Right? So, for example, while growing up, and I was sharing this with my son recently, my elder one, I was telling him, you know, when we were 10 years old, as growing up as little boys, we were, we would eat, we would wash our plate and keep it. It's a habit from 10 years old. So now, the it's automatic. Even if I don't want to do it, it's just automatic. Sometimes, you know, our help, our helper comes home. There's nothing to wash. Because it's a habit. So I would have washed it. I say, okay, I was already washed. You, you see, because when you when when some things are instilled in you, it becomes a habit. And you know that in a house, this is how it should be. Now, if I don't clean up my act in my house, but it's it is my problem. People will look and say, hey. Why your parents? Why why didn't they teach you? Didn't your parents teach you? Right? So in a house, Jesus is the head. And the local church is the body. So how much more must we keep this body clean? Three important applications of the local church being a family. In a family, we must have a proper way to conduct yourself in the family. God's people need to be taught and trained how to be part of the family. We have to train them. We have to teach them. There are things we must do. There are things we must not do. Just look at it in a practical sense. You know, in a house, in our own homes, there are things we must do. There are things we must not do. Right? Some of the things in my house now, especially in my house right now, there are a lot of rules. Because if there are no rules, my boys will do anything they want to do. So because of the rules, they know whether that is there or no. This is a rule. They know it. It is set. They know like, test exam time. This is what you must do. They know that if there's no exams, you can do this. So. We must train our children in the natural, the same way in a local church. We must train the people on what you must do, what you must not do. The house of God, if, if there are no boundaries, the house of God will be a place of chaos, rebellion, and confusion. Just like in a regular house. So we have to teach them proper way to conduct yourself. Conduct yourself. The more, sometimes, you know, I go for house visits and I take the kids and go. Through the entire journey, I tell them what to do, what not to do. Because now you're going to somebody else's house, you're going for prayer. Prayer time, 
don't keep coming and saying dada dada coming and disturbing so they used to do it when they were small but i tell them see now you're grown up these are the things you must do and so they know when i go to a certain person's house this is how i must behave it's something that we are teaching them and they and as they grow they will learn it and it will be instilled inside of them so we have to do it for our uh, people in the church as well because we are a family now if i don't have that sense of family i'll say you do what you want no we must be able to teach them two boundaries between the natural and the spiritual now there is a natural and a spiritual for example see this example here uh before that we have to walk wisely as we balance and draw a clear line between the spiritual family and the natural family now you have we have a natural family and there are things that we do there and there is a spiritual family and there are things that I do there now not necessarily what i do in the natural family i should tell everyone in the spiritual family no right we need to balance so for example someone cannot say i am your spiritual brother so i can move into your house and live there now to tell you the truth i don't want anyone living in my house you can be a brother spiritual father spiritual brother spiritual mother 20 years 30 years in christ unless it's something that is you know they really need a place and they you know it's life and death situation then of course yes but otherwise my home is my home i want to keep it as my home right uh, some of you may agree to it some of you may not agree to it but that's how i want it to be now you can also cannot say i am your sister in the lord therefore i claim your all your natural inheritance so i cannot go to vimal and say vimal i am your brother in christ so for now since you have started this church you give me the church you go home vimal say for what i did all the hard work i did all the running around i started the church it's my vision no no i am your brother you give it to me you 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 go become something else you do uh, you know media look at media since you like media you do media can i tell him that i can but i'll be foolish to tell him that right so because there are natural boundaries and there are spiritual boundaries which i have to maintain and learn to maintain that in the right way thirdly a family has culture values purposes and dreams together right just like in a home a family has culture some houses you take out your footwear get in some houses you can just go in with the slippers or with your footwear some houses everyone around the tv watch eating on my house you better be sitting on the dining table and eating there's no tv in all while eating there's a place you sit there you eat it is there are certain things there are certain cultures that we all follow and right? now in north india when we go for missions they give us the food and we have to sit down within 2 minutes my legs pain so i'm not used to sitting down but it's okay i have to i have to be you know where i am i have to you know understand the culture and be how it is right so we we uh, as a family we have cultures we have values we have purposes and dreams and we must work towards that we must enjoy what god is doing in and through us as a local church culture is important because it helps us to understand each other we define ourselves through the values purposes and dreams that we have as a local church now apc has a certain culture there may be 10 of Hundred different very good churches in Bangalore. They have a different culture. Now APC's culture is this. Doesn't mean I just because they are doing it that way I should follow them, or just because th that other church has thousand people or ten thousand people and I want to no. We all have our own flavor, right? Our culture is uh, so. Let's look at the example through APC, right? Our culture casual. 
contemporary and creative. Be casual. Now, if any, if you come in track pants to church, is it wrong? Nobody will find in church telling you why you come in track pants. You can wear, wear shorts also and come. But it should not be offensive to others. Right? Two, everyone is a minister. Three, we are word-based, spirit-led. We'll go by the word, we go by the spirit. Very simple. We are spiritual yet practical. We want to evangelize to people. Practically, we go about doing it. Active, energetic, and dynamic. What are our values? Integrity. Number one value is integrity. Some things that we always stand by is be truthful in what you're doing. If nobody is watching, God is watching. Integrity. Two, excellence. Be, give your best in what you're doing. Stay on the leading edge on what God is doing. Opportunity for everyone. Unity and cohesiveness and relationships. So these are our values. And we keep, you know, we, we add to these values. We keep uh, trying to reiterate these values into our lives. What are some of our purposes? To glorify and exalt the name of Jesus. APC is not a work of man. It is not a denomination. But it is the work of the Lord and His Spirit. And the work of the Holy Spirit working through His people. So it's not about a man. It's not about one person. It's not a denomination. It's not about the organization. Even though we are an organization, even though we have a church office, we work as an organization. But our whole objective is to glorify Jesus. Two, to make an impact. Be salt and light everywhere. Three, is to equip every believer to be a minister. What is our dream? To raise up five strong local churches all across the city with an attendance of about maybe 50,000 people. Now, remember I told you about dreams? Nobody can stop you from dreaming. So written here. 50,000 people in each location. Can anybody stop us from dreaming? Nobody can stop us. Now, some of us may be thinking, how is this possible? I just went to you know church and came. How is it possible? Nothing wrong in dreaming. Did God say no? You have the vision. You work towards it. God will get it done. Right? So you have the vision. Uh, our dream is to have 50,000 people at each location, five different locations. Raise up several churches all across our city, over our nation, across the nation, and then go into nations impacting. Uh, impacting the world, starting Bible college centers. That's what we are already doing, short-term Bible college. These are things that we want to do. It's a dream for APC. It's something that, you know, to see your dream being fulfilled is so wonderful. You know, when we used to go to North India and do these conferences many, many years ago, I remember, you know, there, were, there used to be very few people initially, uh, 40, 50 people. But over time, God started just bringing in people, opening doors. And then there was a time, I think 2014, uh, we, were, we used to get many people, like 200, 300 people used to start coming for our conferences. Youth started coming in. Now, how did all this happen? I think because of our values and our purposes. Our value was integrity and excellence. Whatever we did, we did it with integrity. In terms of money, in terms of relationships uh, you know when we worked with pastors in different parts of North India excellence integrity you know uh, giving everyone opportunity uni unity this, this is the values that we always carry and the purpose also was there for sure it was not so that we can grow and APC's name goes all across India no it was so that name of Jesus be glorified. Now, some of you, over all these years, there are many of them who have come to Bible college. They've graduated. They've gone and they've started their own churches. We don't even know. They started their own ministries. But the name of Jesus is being glorified. They studied with us two years, three years. They've gone back. All they know is I went to APC. I studied there. But they have their own ministries. So our purpose is to is not to you know have the name apc to be built to do, to be you know to be uh, strengthened or to be you know exalted everywhere it is not that 
our purpose is to name is to make the name of Jesus uh, prevalent wherever we go. Three important family practices in a local church: walk in brotherly love. First Thessalonians four nine and ten. Let's read that. Love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, and indeed you do so towards all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Yeah. Concerning brotherly love, you have no need. Meaning, I urge, but I, we urge you, brethren, that you increase in brotherly love. In a family, we increase in love, right? We increase in our love for one another. We care for each other. And then we give others more preference than for ourselves. And secondly, keep the unity and fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4.3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Look at this Greek word saying, spodazio, means to use speed, to endeavor to be diligent in keeping the unity. Make every effort to maintain unity in the household. Now listen, in a regular house, are there disagreements? Husband and wife, there are disagreements? Brother and sister, disagreements? Father and son, disagreements? Yesterday my son said, Yesterday was uh, Sunday, so Sunday afternoon is football on the terrace. But I was, after church, I went to sleep. And he kept waking me up. I said, yeah, I'll come, I'll come. Then by the time I got off the bed and after my rest and I came, it started to rain. And he got so upset because of you. <laughs> so the whole evening he was not talking to me. He was looking everywhere other than me. So that was more than half an hour, but he can't. Like, so then he came and sat next to me. Why didn't you get up? I said, I was tired, you know. So I, I didn't get enough sleep. I got only three hours of sleep. So after church, I was so tired. So I wanted to come and sleep. Then now it's raining. How will we play football? Because I upset with me. Now I knew he was upset because Monday to Saturday, he's waiting for Sunday for football. So I was not upset. I didn't know it was going to rain. He was very upset with me. And it's understandable. But I had to resolve the problem. So I said, OK, now since we can't go out, let us do one thing. We will play best of five carom board. And then we will play Uno, best of five. He became very happy. Five games. You play five games with me. I said, yes, get the board. He played. You let him win. So he's happy. <laughs> Uno, you play. He forgot. He forgot about football. So we somehow made sure that we're not upset with each other. See, in a natural family, all that will be there, getting upset. But we endeavor, we try to maintain and endeavor, find a way to bring unity and oneness. And the best part is, the Holy Spirit enables us to do it. He gives us the ability to forgive one another. He gives us the ability to look at each other, not through our own eyes, but through the eyes of Jesus. And people persecute, people may ridicule, mock you. You look at them through the eyes of Jesus and say, God, he is also, he or she is part of your body. He is your son. He is your daughter. She is your daughter. She is. So then I must maintain unity and love that's what you expect from me so i will do my part the rest you know i cannot hold on to their reaction but then i will do my part and you take care of the rest right thirdly in in a in a in a household everyone works right first one we walk in brotherly love secondly we keep the unity and fellowship of the holy spirit of the spirit and three, everyone works. Jesus writes in Matthew 20, 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. 
So Jesus is saying, don't just, just because we are leaders, don't just be expected to be served every time. He said, I did not come to be served, but I came to serve people. So in a local church, in a family, all of us take responsibilities and we make sure that the house is in order. Right? We take responsibility. Okay, this is your responsibility. This is your responsibility. Monday, you do this. Tuesday, you do this. Right? In a natural home, we do that. Same way, in, in a church, everyone works. And I say works doesn't mean like, you know, uh, work for an income. I'm talking about everyone is part of what God is doing in the local church, volunteering, serving in the church. Everyone, put your hands to the plow, work, do something for God's kingdom. Right? And God will begin to see, you know, you, you and I will begin to see fruit in our lives. Right? So these are three aspects of family practices of a local church. Walk in brotherly love. Two, keep the unity and fellowship. Three, everyone works. Right? So we'll stop here. I don't want to get into fathers, mothers uh, now. So we'll get into this next week because from here, uh, we can spend a lot of time discussing. And this is something that... Uh, many of us may have questions, especially a lot of this whole thing of sons and daughters, uh, spiritual father, spiritual mother, and how do we go about all of these things, right? Okay, any questions, any thoughts? Shall we close? There are no questions? Okay, we'll close in prayer. Uh, can you just ask a question on the mic? How we can handle those people who come to church with wrong intentions? Yeah, depends on what the intention is. Right? See, people will come in, you, one is you give them time. right? Now, if a person is coming to church just to cause confusion and strife, you have to deal with it immediately because you don't want that to spread. There's a person who's coming to church to spread some false doctrines. Like that's what Paul Paul wrote to Timothy and said, put them out of the local church, meaning hand them over to Satan, meaning take them out of that spiritual covering which we have. So if you know that somebody's coming with the wrong intention, you have to put them out. You speak to them firstly, tell them correct your ways, give them a chance. But if you see that there's no chance, there's no improvement, there's no change, immediately take action. But there are some things you give them time. Now, for, for example, there's some there's an alcoholic, right? He drinks, but he comes to church right? because he wants to change. He wants to, but we know drinking and coming to church is wrong. But you give them time, right? You you journey with them. You you help them to overcome the problem. Right? But he's drinking and coming, but he's not causing any problem in the church. So you give them time. But you also tell him, see, this is why we don't want this. There are people watching people may go to get offended but you give him time you don't just ask him to leave the church but if there's somebody who in the church saying you know trying to cause uh start their own doctrine hey you know what how can the holy how can you use, there's no baptism of the holy spirit or you know there is no holy spirit right now he's gone to heaven and he, this person is spreading this kind of doctrine within the church you get to know it. first thing you do is you tell them stop what you're doing if you're coming here you have to abide by what we have, right? If they don't listen, we put them out of the church because the church is priority, number one priority. The body is priority. So for example, in a natural home, if somebody comes to my house and starts teaching my children something which is wrong, what will I do? I'll say, hey, get out. You have no place in this house. Same way, right? Depends on what the issue is. Uh, and then you bring in correction. Right. All right. Let's uh, let's close. Uh, uh, just, just quickly say a word of prayer. Father, we want to thank you for this time. Thank you for teaching us through your word, oh God, and continue to, uh, Lord, speak and minister to us and use us, Lord, for building your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you next class for the next session.